All right, so let us continue with whatever we were doing. See uh, our aim as I told you is to prove the Picard theorems for which we need to look at uh, families of meromorphic functions. So we need to uh, do topology on a space of meromorphic functions ok. And uh, so I told you in the previous lectures that uh, you know if you want to do topology on a space of functions and you go and try to draw inspiration from the usual topology. Uh, then for example, if you look at uh, real valued or complex valued bounded functions, continuous functions on a topological space, then the, top, the topology is done by looking at uh, uh, uniform convergence ok. So, we, we, we define convergence in the space uh, by uh, uniform convergence. But now if you try to um, take inspiration from this and come to complex analysis, and uh, then you are working of course with holomorphic functions your that, that are that are that is analytic functions and then otherwise uh, you we want to be a little bit more general and we want to work with meromorphic functions and meromorphic functions you know are analytic or holomorphic functions except for a, uh, an isolated set of points where they have only pole singularities ok. So, you want to work with such functions, but the point is that even if you take analytic functions ok and you look at a uh, sequence of analytic functions converging. Okay. Normally what happens is that you do not get uh, uh, uniform convergence, okay, but you get only normal convergence. So, the, so, when you come from topology to complex analysis, you must remember that you should not work with uniform convergence, but you should work with uniform convergence restricted to compact sets and that is called normal convergence. Okay. That is the first point. Then the second point is this pathology that you know you can have a, a domain in which uh, you can have a decent uh, sequence of analytic functions which goes to infinity everywhere ok. Now, so for example, I was discussing about this this uh, uh, this domain which is the exterior of the uh, unit disc and I said you take the uh, you know the, the sequence of functions given by z power n. So, the first function is z, the second function is z squared and so on and then this sequence you know it converges point wise to the function which is infinity ok. So, and the point is that this convergence uh, normally if you are uh, uh, if you are only thinking of a first course in complex analysis we will say this sequence diverges ok. Because uh, if you take any complex number z with modulus greater than 1 and you look at the sequence z power n that is not going to go to a limit it is going to go to infinity ok. You will simply say the sequence diverges. But the fact is that we want to think of this as a convergent sequence and there are two reasons for this. The first thing is that uh, it converges to uh, the constant function which is infinity at every point outside the unit disc and we have to allow the value infinity because we want to think of meromorphic functions. Because uh, see if you are thinking of meromorphic functions then you can define the value at a pole 
to be infinity because that is the limit that you get as you approach the pole. Okay. So, uh, we have to allow the value infinity and once you allow the value infinity then you must also allow the constant function which is infinity and if you go by that reasoning then the sequence uh, z power n actually tends to the constant function infinity and, th and that is the reason that we, uh, we say that z power n tends to the constant function infinity, uh, it tends to the constant function infinity uh, uh, outside the uh, unit disc okay? and uh, uh, in the exterior of the unit disc all right? and uh, of course the unit circle is not included. Uh, we are looking at the exterior of the unit circle and then uh, the point is that if, uh, 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 if you want to talk about this convergence in terms of a metric okay, then you will have to uh, worry about giving a metric on the extended complex plane and I told you that that metric that you can use is the spherical metric there is a so called spherical metric and what is the spherical metric you take two points in the extended complex plane take their images in on the Riemann sphere under the stereographic projection and then use the spherical metric on the Riemann sphere. The spherical metric on the Riemann sphere is just the, uh, it is the length of the minor arc of the big circle passing through those two points uh, on the Riemann sphere. Okay. So, in this way you get a, a spherical metric on the extended complex plane and then with respect to this spherical metric I can actually uh, define the distance between any point, any two points in the extended plane. So, for example, I can have one point which is a point in the complex plane, I have I can have the other point to be a point at infinity and I can still have this notion of distance. Okay. And it is with respect to this metric, the spherical metric that the convergence is actually normal. Okay. So, uh, so here this is the point that we have to understand. If you take the sequence of functions z power n in the domain mod z greater than 1, then this sequence converges normally to the constant function infinity. Okay. And this is the viewpoint that is very important. Okay. And what I am trying to uh, tell you today is that you know this is the only pathology that will that, that can occur. If you take a domain in the, in the complex plane and suppose you have a sequence of analytic functions which converge normally to a function on the domain okay, uh, and assume that you allow this function the limit function to take the value infinity suppose you assume that you allow that then uh, it is very beautiful that either the limit function is completely analytic or it is completely infinity. You do not get anything in between. So, you know uh, you, you do not get this, uh, this kind of horrible pathology that you have a sequence of analytic functions and they tend to a for example, a meromorphic function okay, that will not happen. You cannot have a sequence of analytic functions on a domain they, they converge normally okay, that is they converge uniformly on compact subset of the domain and in the limit you get. Uh, lo behold you suddenly get a meromorphic function that will not happen. So, uh, so this is a very very important thing it tells you that things are going on well uh, as you know uh, as per usual intuition something does not you must always uh, see whenever you work with uh, some ex extraordinary cases you should always be careful. So, for example, when I am allowing a function to take the value infinity the function can very well be a meromorphic function because meromorphic function takes the value infinity at the poles. So, uh, it can happen that I have a sequence of analytic functions on a domain, it is converging normally to a limit function. Now, if I allow the limit function to take the value infinity, okay, then the limit function could very well be even meromorphic, okay. uh, but the fact is that does not happen. What happens is either the limit function is analytic that is the good thing. And the and the in, and in the bad case, the worst thing happens. The limit function is always infinity, okay. And the reason for this is two two important facts. One fact is the theorem of Hurwitz uh, for analytic functions. The other thing is the uh, so-called uh, uh, symmetry of the uh, spherical metric with respect to inversion. Okay. So uh, these are the two facts, and uh, this is what I wanted to con concentrate today upon. So so I'll start with the following thing. Um, uh, uh, let uh, 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 maps uh, uh, d comma c union infinity. Uh, so let look at this set. Let this be the 
set of maps or just functions from uh, D uh, which is uh, it is a domain D is a domain in the complex plane uh, to uh, the external complex plane. So, this is the important thing I am allowing the value infinity all right. Um, and so, what I am going to do is uh, there are there are many uh, subsets of this which I am interested in. So, so let me write them down among this is inside this is this this is the I will put this C of D C union infinity and what is this C of C this is the uh, set of continuous maps this is a set of continuous maps okay. Uh, and you know when I say this is a set of continuous maps I am looking at all those maps which are continuous from this domain D to C union infinity and mind you C union infinity has a topology. So, uh, C union infinity has a one point compactification topology and under this with this topology it is uh, homeomorphic to the Riemann sphere under the stereographic projection and in fact it is in fact even a metric space okay you can take uh, either the spherical metric or the chordal metric on the Riemann sphere and transport it to C union infinity via the stereographic projection and so C union infinity becomes even a metric space it becomes a complete metric space it is compact it is very nice okay. So, it does make sense to look at continuous maps into a topological space or a metric space so it is continuous in that sense okay. So, uh, the point I want you to understand is that now if you look at this set of continuous maps into C union infinity then the constant map which is equal to infinity okay that is the map that takes every uh, uh, every point to infinity that is also con continuous because mind you always constant maps are always continuous okay. So, the function which is infinity uniformly that is a continuous function mind you. So, this is the point that you have to carefully notice this is what we introduce and and in particular what happens is that this contains the uh, this uh, this set m of t the set of meromorphic functions on D the set you take any meromorphic function on D what is a meromorphic function a meromorphic function is a holomorphic function on D minus an isolated set of points for which uh, the given function has poles at which the given function has poles. So, you take a meromorphic function on D okay it is a honest function outside an it is a honest holomorphic function outside a you know isolated set of points, but at each of those isolated set of points in D the function has a pole, but I can define the value of the function to be infinity at a pole because that is the limit I get as I approach a pole okay that is the definition of pole okay and uh, therefore, this a meromorphic function uh, becomes a continuous function into C union infinity that is the point that is another critical point you have to understand okay. By including the value infinity you are making the meromorphic function continuous on the whole domain you are making it continuous even at the poles okay and do not confuse that continuity with the usual continuity because the usual continuity is with respect to complex numbers the target is complex numbers and you do not allow the value infinity okay. But this continuity is different this continuity is with respect to the extended complex plane okay this is something that you have to clearly uh, uh, distinguish okay because you know if a, a meromorphic function in, uh, in the usual sense cannot be continuous at a pole because at the pole it becomes infinity okay. Uh, but and, and that is because you do not allow it to take the value infinity you do not think of infinity as a value if you are if you are only thinking of complex values. But now since I have added the extra point at infinity the meromorphic function becomes also continuous at infinity that is the point you must notice and then of course there is of course the uh, the, the further subset of h of d this is our this is the subset of all holomorphic functions okay or analytic functions and of course you know holomorphic or analytic functions are also by default they are also included as meromorphic functions. So, the meromorphic function is a function which uh, can either be analytic or if it has singularities the singularities must only be isolated and the is they must be only poles that is the definition okay. So, the definition of meromorphic includes the definition of holomorphic okay. So, uh, so let me write that this oops. So, this is uh, so this is uh, m of d is uh, uh, meromorphic function and uh, h of t is holomorphic functions 
and uh, so you know uh, basically what we want to do is we want to do topology on this set, uh, the set of metamorphic functions all right on the domain D and I told you this topology has to be done with respect to uh, I mean uh, we do we, we, we say that we do topology by trying to study convergence okay. So, the convergence that we should think of is normal convergence. So, the, the, you, the, the topology corresponds to working with normal convergence okay. And what we saw last time is that uh, if you take the domain to be the exterior of the unit circle okay, if you take the domain to be exterior of the unit circle and you take the sequence z n, uh, z power n okay, namely z, z squared, z cube, then that is a sequence of, that is a sequence in h of d, that is a sequence of holomorphic functions. And it converges normally to what? It converges normally to the to the constant function infinity, which is uh, which is in this set above. Uh, this script C uh, D C union infinity. It's here. Okay. And uh, so I want to say the following thing. You you must have uh, uh, you must have studied this in a first course in topology, but uh, the idea is essentially the same. Namely that whenever you have a uniform limit okay the limit function is also continuous okay so that's the first thing that i want to uh, uh, that's the first thing i want to prove uh, or recall at least uh, and mind you here we are not working with uniform convergence on the whole domain whatever convergence we are working with is only normal convergence that's the that's this but that's good enough because you know normal convergence will also give locally uniform convergence so locally you can still do the same thing that you would do if you had uniform convergence everywhere okay and that's good enough for local properties like continuity analyticity etc that is good enough okay so uh, so here is a here is a lemma uh, here is a lemma uh, uh, if uh, fn uh, is a sequence of uh, uh, continuous maps from the domain D into C union infinity uh, and F n tends to F which is thought of as a map from D to C union infinity. So, that means when I say F n tends to F point wise, so this is point wise on D okay, that means F n of z tends to the value F of z as n tends to infinity for each z in d okay uh, and uh, this convergence is normal on d then f is also a continuous map from d to c union infinity. So, I am uh, I, I am just saying that a normal limit of continuous maps is continuous and uh, uh, and why should this be true because you know uniform limit of continuous maps is continuous and uh, if you have a normal limit it is actually a uni uniform limit locally okay and therefore the limit function is continuous locally but continuity is a local property therefore if something is continuous locally then it is continuous if you have a global map which is locally continuous continuous on every uh, on sufficiently small open sets okay which cover the domain then it is continuous okay. So, this is a very uh, uh, this the, the proof of this lemma is just uh, trivial I mean if you assume the fact that the uniform limit of continuous functions is continuous okay. So, this is something that <coughs> you can easily deduce Wh what you. So, let me let me pinpoint the important fact here if you take a point in D okay then you can choose a sufficiently small disk surrounding that point to lie in D that is because D is an D is a domain mind you D is an open connected set. So, D is an open set. So, if you give me a point of D there is a whole disk surrounding that point which is lying inside D and if I make the radius of the disk small enough I can ensure that even the boundary of that disk lies inside D. Okay. Now, if I include the boundary to the, di the, to the disk then it becomes a compact set because it is a closed and bounded set and on a compact set I know that this convergence is not is actually uniform because I have been given normal convergence. Normal convergence means that whenever you look at the convergence on a compact subset it is uniform okay. Therefore, if you give me any point I can find a sufficiently small 
disk on whose closure the convergence is uniform. So, in particular it is also uniform on sufficiently small disks ok. That means that the limit function on sufficiently small disks is continuous, but then I can cover the whole space by such small disks. So, the limit function becomes continuous everywhere ok that is the proof alright. So, uh, so I will not write down the proof I have told you in words. Now, uh, now comes a now comes a very important theorem. Uh, so, so here is a theorem. The theorem is that. Uh, so, so let me tell you. Uh, uh, in this lemma, we have been only worrying about continuous maps. All right. Now you can ask this question uh, because in the you know in the previous uh, slide, I've uh, if you look at the previous slide, I have given you these two subsets. There is one subset which is m of d, which is the uh, meromorphic functions and then there is this other sub subset which is h of d which is the holomorphic functions and then you can ask that ask what will happen to the limit function if uh, the se given sequence of functions is in m of d or h of d. So, you can ask uh, so what we have just now proved in this lemma is that uh, a, a normal limit of continuous functions is continuous all right that is what the lemma says. Now, you can ask is a normal limit of meromorphic functions meromorphic that is one question you can ask. Then the other question you can ask is is the normal limit of uh, holomorphic that is analytic functions analytic you can ask that. But you know you already have a we have an ex, we have seen an exception we have seen an example of a normal limit of uh, holomorphic analytic functions which is going to the constant function infinity ok. Now, this is the only exception that is the beautiful thing. So, uh, in the case of analytic functions and that is theorem ok. So, if you if you uh, if you are looking at a uh, sequence of uh, holomorphic or analytic functions suppose it converges normally to a limit function then the limit function is either completely holomorphic that is completely analytic or it is completely infinity it is a constant function infinity and there is nothing in between ok. So, this is very good behavior. So, uh, so, so what it means is that you know if you are uh, the exceptional when, whenever you uh, whenever you are working with respect to the uh, the spherical metric whenever you are that is you are working with respect to the extended complex plane namely you are allowing the value infinity ok. Then you must allow the exceptional case that a sequence of holomorphic function tends to the constant function infinity uniformly on compact sets ok. That is the only exception that is what the theorem says. So, for example, you do not have this uh, further pathologies like you know you have a sequence of uh, analytic functions and in the limit you get a meromorphic function. Suddenly a pole pops up in the limit you know such kind of horrible behavior does not happen ok. Now, that, that is very very important that tells you that you know it is a the behavior is very good right. So, otherwise you would have been worried if you can find a sequence of analytic functions ok which is converging normally to a limit function and the limit function suddenly starts having poles you know you of course, intuitively you do not expect that to happen, but uh, yeah, how do you prove that such a thing does not happen and that is what the theorem says ok. So, let me write that down theorem uh, if f n uh, is uh, a sequence of holomorphic functions on d h of d uh, and uh, f n converges to f normally on D then either f is also holomorphic or f is identically infinity that is all. You do not get the intermediate case of f being meromorphic ok. So, this is a this is a theorem and uh, uh, this is I mean intuitively this looks fine, but you uh, the big deal with serious mathematics is to guess uh, some statements which are intuitive and then the bigger deal is to really prove them Give, giving proofs is very important a very important part of mathematics. So, um, so let us go to this uh, well so now so, so the proof requires a couple of things the fir first of all the proof requires uh, <coughs> uh, the so called invariance of the spherical metric with respect to inversion. So, let me explain that. So, uh, that that is one that is one ingredient in the proof the other ingredient in the proof is uh, so called Hurwitz theorem which probably you have seen it in a first course in complex analysis, but I do not expect many people 
to have seen it in a first course in complex analysis. So, I will tell you what that theorem is. It is pre, a pretty simple theorem, it is got to do with uniform convergence and it is got to do with the argument principle which you might have seen. Okay. So, um, so, let me start with this, start with uh, uh, the, uh, the invariance of the spherical metric with respect to uh, inversion. So, let us again uh, recall, so, so, let, so let me put this here, maybe I will use a, use a different color. Um, so, um, well, uh, uh, invariance of the spherical metric uh, with respect to uh, inversion. This is a this is a very important fact. So here is my. So here is what I'm going to say. So, so you see you have this, you have this, uh, so let me again uh, draw this stereographic projection. Uh, so, here is the, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is the x y plane, uh, this is the complex plane which is identified with the x, x y plane and then you have this, uh, you have the, uh, uh, well you have the Riemann sphere again. Uh, and of course, there is this third axis which uh, uh, so here is the third one. This is U because uh, of course you know I've been I'm I'm reserving um, um, I'm reserving Z to be X plus I Y, so I'm calling the third axis as U, and uh, now you see you take two points uh, z1 and say z2 okay uh, on the complex plane and in fact you know uh, uh, they then you get their stereographic projections on the riemann sphere so you get these points so you get this point p1 and you get this point p2 okay and of course you know you get p1 by so this is the north pole and you join uh, north pole to p1 then it should go and hit z1 you join north pole to p2 and it has to go and hit z2 okay so this is the uh, this is the definition of the stereographic projection and uh, what is the spherical distance between uh, z1 and z2 this is actually the uh, spherical distance uh, on uh, 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 well let me call this as, oops Uh, let me call this as S2. This is the real two sphere. Uh, this is a top, this topological standard topological notation. So I'll let me put this put S2 here uh, uh, between P1 and P2. And what is the what is the thing I've written on the right? This DS uh, superscript S2 is actually the uh, uh, the you know the uh, geodesic distance. It's it's the distance uh, along uh, uh, the great circle passing through P1 and P2, you know if you have a sphere and you take two points on the sphere, uh, if they are two distinct points, there is only one big circle, circle of largest radius that passes through those two points and lies on the sphere, that is called the great circle passing through those two points. Okay? And then what you do is that uh, you have these two points on the circle and they divide the circle into uh, a, um, a, a smaller portion, a larger portion in general and you take the length of the smaller arc. Okay? So, that is what this distance here is and that is defined to be equal to the distance of <coughs> uh, the distance spherical distance between the points z1 and z2. Okay? And uh, well this is this is spherical distance. Now, the point is that uh, you know uh, uh, I, I need also to write something here. So, um, so let me do the following thing. Uh, let me take another color. Uh, so, you have also, uh, so so if I write it out in a, uh, um, well, uh, so let me write it somewhere here. Um, yeah. So you have you have S two, and you have this stereographic projection with with C union infinity. C so C union infinity is the extended complex plane there is a point at infinity added to that 
this set of complex numbers and this infinity goes to uh, the north pole mind you under the stereographic projection. So, what I have written here is a stereographic projection and uh, see the point the, the, so this is so here p 1 goes to uh, z 1 and p 2 goes to z 2 ok and this is this is a situation that we have, but on C or in infinity there is an automorphism ok there is a self isomorphism uh, there is an isomorphism at least as a set and what is that isomorphism that is inversion ok. So, on C and in infinity you have uh, the map z going to 1 by z, z going to 1 by z makes sense on uh, C and infinity where you declare 0 to go to infinity and you declare infinity to go to 0. So, it interchanges 0 and infinity, but for points which are different from 0 and infinity you know uh, for a complex number which is different from 0 and infinity uh, of course, when you say complex number infinity is not allowed. So, if it is a non-zero complex number then its reciprocal is also a non-zero complex number. So, uh, so the point is that on this right side here which is the C in infinity there is this map z going to 1 by z and this map z going to 1 by z is in fact a homeomorphism because you know it is continuous and it is it remains continuous even if you give C in infinity the uh, of course, you know z going to 1 by z is continuous in, in the punctured complex plane that is if you take the complex plane and remove the origin z going to 1 by z is actually you know holomorphic isomorphism because it is an injective holomorphic map and he, he, you do not have to uh, worry uh, go, go too deep because its inverse is itself for z going to 1 by z the inverse map is itself ok. You apply the map twice you get identity ok. So, it is a holomorphic isomorphism it is an analytic isomorphism from c minus 0 to c minus 0, but the point is if you include 0 then you have to also include infinity and you have to send 0 to infinity and you have to send infinity to 0 and in therefore, you get a bijective map of the extended complex plane and that map is actually a homeomorphism ok with respect to the uh, one point compactification topology on C in infinity you can check that. So, uh, but you see this uh, so z going to in 1 by z which is inversion is a is a homeomorphism on the extended plane. Now, if you tran if you if you if you transport that via the stereographic projection you will get an you will get a homeomorphism of the real sphere S 2 which is the Riemann sphere ok. Because you know uh, if if two spaces are isomorphic then uh, if two if two topological spaces are isomorphic that is homeomorphic. Uh, if on one space you have a automorphism a homeomorphism self homeomorphism then this isomorphism will transport it and give rise to a homeomorphism self homeomorphism of the other space ok. So, this inversion which is a homeomorphism of the self homeomorphism of the extended plane will give you a self homeomorphism Riemann sphere ok and guess what is what it is guess what it is you know what it is it is you can check it it is actually nothing but rotation of the uh, Riemann sphere ok it is rotation of the Riemann sphere about the x axis ok and you can see that that is because you see uh, uh, look I, I you you take any uh, you take any point on the on, on the x axis ok you take any point on the x axis uh, say for example, take the point 1 take the point 1 ok on the x axis that is a, that corresponds to the complex number 1 ok. Where does it go under inversion it goes back to 1 all right and the point minus 1 goes back to minus 1. And you know the stereographic projection is such that for every point on the unit circle the point on the Riemann sphere is the same as the point on the unit circle for the stereographic projection. The stereographic projection induces a bijection on the unit circle because the unit circle lies also on the complex plane it lies also on the Riemann sphere on S 2 and this stereographic projection fixes point wise it fixes the unit circle. So, uh, this inversion uh, it is going to induce uh, some uh, you know uh, homeomorphism of the uh, Riemann sphere that is going to fix plus 1 and minus 1 ok and look at what happens to uh, look at what happens to the point at infinity and inversion infinity goes to 0 and 0 goes to infinity ok. Now, what is what does this translate to the Riemann sphere you see on the Riemann sphere infinity corresponds to the north pole 0 corresponds to the south pole ok. The point 0 corresponds to the south pole because you see the 0 is here 
and you know if you uh, what is the stereographic projection of 0 it is you, you have to take the line joining the north pole uh, to 0 and then look at the unique point on the Riemann sphere uh, where this line hits and that will be the south pole. Okay. So, 0 cor 0 on the complex plane corresponds to south pole on the Riemann sphere. So, you know this uh, this inversion which sends 0 to infinity and infinity to 0 on the on the external plane when you translate it to the Riemann sphere it will send north pole to the south pole and south pole to the north pole. Now, you can imagine this map what it is doing it is switching the north and south poles and it is fixing plus or minus 1. So, it is a rotation about the uh, x axis that is what is happening. Okay. So, this is you can use uh, your uh, you know uh, analytic geometry and you can actually write out equations and check that this is actually a rotation by 180 degrees of the of the sphere with respect to the x axis. Okay. And now uh, what does this tell you? This tells you that if I take the points z 1 and z 2 okay, and I take the spherical distance between them and if I take the inverse points 1 by z 1 and 1 by z 2 and take the spherical distance between the inverse points that will be the same because the spherical distances are being measured by looking at the corresponding points on the sphere and the inversion corresponds to rotation of the sphere, but any uh, if you take any two points on the sphere the spherical distance between those two points that is not going to change if I rotate the sphere that is invariant under rotation of the sphere. So, the moral of the story is that the spherical distance between z 1 and z 2 is the same as the spherical distance between 1 by z 1 and z 2. In other words the spherical metric is invariant for the inversion that is a very important fact which we are going to use in the proof. Okay. So, uh, so let me write this down. Um, uh, so, so let me say uh, let me write somewhere here. Uh, so, so diagrammatically uh, what we are going to have is that so this is z 1 and let us say that uh, 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 this is z 2. Uh, sorry this is uh, uh, so so if this is z1 then this is so 1 by z1 is going to lie somewhere here and uh, if this is z2 then uh, 1 by z2 is going to lie somewhere here and uh, this uh, uh, 1 by z1 and 1 by z2 are going to correspond to uh, 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 points uh, p1 prime and uh, p2 prime on the uh, riemann sphere and the fact is that the uh, uh, the spherical distance between uh, the the spherical distance on S2 between P1 prime uh, and P2 prime is the same as the spherical distance on S2 uh, between P1 and P2 because P1 prime P, P1 prime and P2 prime are just gotten from P1 P2 by rotation by 180 degrees. Okay, and uh, so in other words, I am saying that you know th see this this uh, if I draw this arc here and if I draw this arc here uh, they are of the same length mind you this is a perspective drawing. So, they do not really look to be of the same length uh, when I when I draw it on this, but they are of the same length essentially and uh, uh, well. Uh, so, uh, but, but, but you see this 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 guy here on top is uh, the spherical distance between uh, 1 by z 1 and 1 by z 2 and this guy here in the bottom is a spherical distance between z 1 and z 2. Okay. And this the spherical distance <coughs> is invariant under inversion and the way I have drawn it I have taken z 1 z 2 in the complex plane, but you can make one of them or even both of them infinity it still works it still works. Okay. So, the moral of the story is therefore, uh, so, so let me also mention this um, p 1 goes to z 1 p 2 goes to z 2 and of course, uh, uh, so let me write it here uh, p 1 prime p 1 prime goes to z 1 prime p 2 prime corresponds sorry. Uh, so, z 1 prime is actually 1 by z 1 and p 2 prime is goes to z 2 prime which is 1 by z 2. Okay. So, uh, so let me write the statement here uh, the so the 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 uh, holomorphic uh, that is analytic uh, isomorphism uh, z going to 1 over z from 
c minus 0 to c minus 0 c minus 0 oops uh, extends to a homeomorphism uh, c union infinity to c union infinity and this is inversion uh, where uh, you know uh, you send infinity goes to 0 and, uh, and 0 goes to infinity uh, and uh, the homeomorphism the homeomorphism that it induces via the stereographic projection on S2 S2 to S2 uh, that it induces via the stereographic projection is just rotation of uh, S2 about the x axis uh, axis by 180 degrees ok. So, this is a fact that you need to check uh, uh, you can write it out it is a very simple you know exercise in analytic geometry if you want ok. Uh, but the point is that uh, distances on the sphere will not change if you rotate the sphere. So, the upshot is thus uh, uh, for all points uh, z 1 comma z 2 in, in C union infinity uh, the spherical distance between z 1 and z 2 is the same as the spherical distance between 1 by z 1 and 1 by z 2. So, this is the fact that we want this this uh, so it, it uses the fact that uh, if you distances on the sphere will not change if you rotate the sphere and uh, uh, and the rotation of the sphere by 180 degrees about the x axis corresponds to actually uh, it translates to inversion for the uh, extended plane ok. So, the spherical metric is is inversion invariant. So, so let me write that in words i e the uh, so d s ok see the, the spherical metric d s is inversion invariant ok. So, this is uh, this is one fact that we need to use ok. I need this I need to use this fact this 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 fact will be used in trying to prove our theorem that you know if you have a sequence of analytic functions on a domain uh, either it converges to uh, an analytic function or it converges uh, to uh, the constant function infinity uh, provided you assume the, conver the, the, the convergence is normal uniform on compact subsets ok. So, this is one fact the other fact is uh, the very important Hurwitz theorem ok which uh, which I will try to explain next. So, uh, so, uh, the next thing that I need is Hurwitz's theorem so, that is another thing that I need Hurwitz's theorem ok. So, what is this Hurwitz's theorem? Um, so, basically the uh, the theorem is very very simple what the, what the theorem says is that uh, it tells you something that is very uh, very very believable what it says is that you know if you take a normal limit of analytic functions holomorphic functions then of course you know the limit function uh, 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 suppose the limit function uh, is complex valued not it does not take the value infinity. So, we are in the uh, in the in the in the setup of an undergraduate course of complex analysis where all complex functions take only values in C ok and you are not allowing the value infinity ok. Uh, so, suppose the sequence of analytic functions converges normally to a function 
which takes values only in C then you know already that this limit function is already analytic that is something that you know I have already explained to you that a normal limit of analytic functions is analytic provided you are you make sure that the limit function uh, takes values only in C okay. This is again uh, uh, something that you have seen in a first course in complex analysis basically using Moreira's theorem and Cauchy's theorem okay. So, the limit function is analytic. Now, what Hurwitz's theorem says is that if you take a 0 of the limit function okay, mind you the limit function is analytic and you know an analytic function has isolated zeros unless it is identically 0 and a non-constant analytic function if you take the zeros they are isolated that is a very important fact and it, it for example it is, it is as powerful as the identity theorem which says that if two analytic functions are uh, having the same values on a uh, convergent set of points e even at the limit uh, including the limit uh, which is also a point of analyticity then the functions have to be identically the same <coughs> that is the identity theorem and that is equivalent to the uh, this, this theorem that the zeros of an analytic function are isolated non, a non constant analytic function the zeros are isolated ok. So, you take you take a normal sequence of analytic functions uh, and you take the limit function it is analytic and you take a 0 of the limit function then what Hurwitz theorem says is that this 0, zero of the limit function comes from zeros of the functions of the original sequence. In fact, if you take a 0 of the limit function it has to have a certain order you know zeros always have a certain order this is so you will have a 0 of order 1 or order 2 and so on. So, if the order of the 0 is capital N Hurwitz theorem says that this because this limit function has come as a normal limit of a sequence what it will say is that beyond a certain stage all the each of the functions in your sequence will also have n zeros the same number of zeros uh, with multiplicity as the zero of the limit function that you are looking at and these zeros uh, and and this will happen in a neighborhood of that zero of the limit function and what will happen is slowly as n tends to infinity these zeros will cluster and cluster and cluster and come closer and closer and in the limit they will all coalesce to the zero of the limit function. So, basically what Hurwitz theorem says is that the zero of the limit function is actually coming as a limit of zeros of the original functions beyond a certain stage and the way this is done is that it is done very precisely in the sense that even multiplicities are taken care of that is essentially what Hurwitz theorem is ok. Uh, this is how you say it in words but uh, I mean uh, but if you start of course when you technically write it down it looks uh, uh, pretty more difficult ok. So, uh, uh, so now so let me write this let me write the statement of the theorem down. Uh, suppose uh, uh, Fn uh, converges to F uniformly uh, uh, normally on D uh, 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 D domain uh, and uh, uh, Fn and F are all holomorphic functions on D and uh, is it not belonging to D is a 0 of F of of order n greater than 0 then there exists a row such that uh, 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 Fn of Z has n zeros in mod z minus z naught less than rho for n sufficiently large. So, when I say n zeros uh, uh, counted with multiplicity counted with multiplicity uh, in this disk uh, for n sufficiently large. Uh, and of course, uh, 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 mod z minus z naught less than rho is in D. So, you have to choose rho small enough uh, that is such a rho uh, and further and, and these zeros 
uh, and these zeros, these zero sets converge to Z naught as n tends to infinity. So, this is Hurwitz's theorem, this is Hurwitz's theorem in, uh, in notations. Okay. So, uh, so, what it says is that uh, uh, the, the a 0 z naught of the limit function, the limit analytic function f is the limit point of zeros of uh, the functions in the sequence and the fact is that even the multiplicities are taken care of. Mind you multiplicities are very very important because you know multiplicities uh, you have to count zeros with multiplicities. You cannot just count zeros just as points. It may be a, uh, a zero uh, it, a function may have zero at, at a point, but it may have a certain multiplicity that is the order of the zero you have to count the order also. Okay. So, that is why multiplicities are important these n zeros they need not be n distinct points they could be lesser than n points with some points having zeros of higher order. Okay, so, multiplicity is very important. So, this is Hurwitz's theorem okay. and the proof of this theorem essentially uses the argument principle. Okay. Uh, it uses the argument principle and it uses uniform convergence. Okay. So, uh, I will I'll, I'll try to uh, give a proof of that in the I will give a sketch of that proof in the next talk.